what is up bitcoiners this is your boy ck and uh, i'm excited to bring you this next episode of the bitcoin magazine podcast this week i sit down with alex gladstein of the human rights foundation and he brings on richard myers of global mesh labs and ben kaufman of specter wallet to talk about some new fundraising and fund allocating that the human rights foundation is doing the Human Rights Foundation, of course, is committed to Bitcoin development and in supporting human rights and taking down of dictatorships across the globe. And they see Bitcoin as a important tool in doing that. And in order to make sure that Bitcoin is decentralized, that Bitcoin is easy to use, accessible and not dependent on outside infrastructure and traditional Internet infrastructure, they are funding one global mesh labs and richard myers to build out a more decentralized way in order to access the internet and access the bitcoin blockchain and they're also funding uh ben kaufman of specter wallet who is building uh, a multi-sig aggregator wallet that is right on top of bitcoin core and it makes it much much easier for people to run their own full node and to use multi-sig or to use their favorite hardware wallet in a way that gives them all their be the best Bitcoin features and uh, leverages a full node, right? Instead of leveraging someone else's node. So using Bitcoin trustlessly with an awesome UX. So I'm a big fan of Spectre Wallet. I've used it myself many times. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, Alex Gladstein, Richard Myers, Ben Kaufman and I, we have a conversation about where Bitcoin is today, what Bitcoin needs in order to get to where it needs to be. And I just think this conversation is really prescient given uh, the fallout of what we've seen uh, this last weekend uh, and week with, uh, with deplatforming uh, you know, on social media and across the internet. So um, depend doesn't matter what political uh, side you kind of align with, uh, you know, it's obvious that censorship on the inter internet is possible, and that's why we need Bitcoin to not depend on the internet, and that's why we need Bitcoin to be accessible and for normal people to be able to validate Bitcoin because it's that important. Before we get into this podcast, though, I want to tell you guys about our sponsors. First is LVL.co. You've heard about them many times. It is a new kind of Bitcoin exchange. It's not like a brokerage account. It is more like a checkings account. So when you get an LVL.co account, you get a FDIC insured checkings account that's right next to a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, you can transfer Bitcoin and USD between those wallets seamlessly without any fees and without any spread. spread. They're not making money on the transfer of USD and BTC. They're making money when you swipe your debit card or when you use other services that they provide, like a normal bank. So they allow you to bank on Bitcoin. They allow you to get paid in Bitcoin. You get paid in USD. That money hits your checking account within LVL.co. And then whatever percentage you want transferred to Bitcoin, boom, automatically transferred to Bitcoin. You can be like Russell Okun today with LVL.co. Make sure to go check them out right now. I am a big fan. I love seeing this new direction of Bitcoin banking and uh, getting people from fiat into Bitcoin. So uh, I like what LVL.co is doing. Next is Blockstacks. You guys, this is a new sponsor and Blockstacks. If you haven't heard of them, they have been building decentralized tech on top of Bitcoin for a very long time. They are launching a brand new sidechain for Bitcoin. It is Stacks. Stacks, again, it used to be called Blockchain, uh, Blockstack, um, but it unlocks a ton of new use cases and functionality for the world's most well-known, most secure, and most important blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain. Without modifying Bitcoin at all, Stacks 2.0 blockchain allows Bitcoin to scale with the Clarity smart contracting language that was designed by Stacks developers and Al Algorand developers in order to make Bitcoin more scalable and programmable. Developers can now build on the capital security and immutability of Bitcoin and explore a world of Bitcoin-based DeFi and decentralized applications. Proof of transfer or POX is a groundbreaking consensus mechanism that makes it all possible. POX connects the Stacks blockchain to Bitcoin. So that is how you get that Bitcoin native currency on the Stacks blockchain. Um, and it enables mining and staking. So 
STX holders uh, who are, you know, helping the Stacks blockchain maintain consensus, they actually earn BTC rewards. So you get paid in Bitcoin and the entire ecosystem is denominated in Bitcoin. So it's a blockchain where Bitcoin is money, Stacks, apps, and smart contracts on Bitcoin. For more information and to register for their Stacks 2 launch event, go to stacks2.com. That's Stacks, S-T-A-C-K-S, followed by the number two, dot com. All right, guys, that is enough from me. Again, check out these sponsors, LVL.co and Blockstacks, uh, and make sure to check out all of the guys I interviewed, Alex from HRF, Ben Kaufman from Spectre Wallet, and Richard Myers from Global Mesh Labs. Let's get into the show. Welcome, Bitcoiners, to another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. Today, I am super excited to be sitting here with Alex Gladstein once again from the HRF, Ben Kaufman of Spectre Wallet, and Richard Myers of Global Mesh Labs and Gotenna. Um, super excited to be sitting with these three guys to talk about um, building censorship resistant self sovereign technology for Bitcoiners and focusing on privacy. Uh, and really the reason why we have these three here is because HRF is uh, doing some more, uh, you know, funding of, of Bitcoin development work. So I want to kick it straight off to Alex, who uh, can give the listeners an update on what HRF is doing this week. Sure. So this will be the latest round of gifts from the Human Rights Foundation's Bitcoin Development Fund. And these in particular are uh, made possible by our friends uh, Cameron and Tyler uh, at, at Gemini. And uh, we told them that we wanted to focus on basically uh, resilience and access to the network with this round of gifts. Um, so we're really happy to make uh, gifts of $25,000 uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, uh, one, one gift to Ben for his work on Spectre. Uh, desktop and, and one gift to um, Richard and his two colleagues for their upcoming work on uh, implementing uh, like a mobile solution uh, for this lot 49 protocol, which is very, very exciting. And we'll let them describe this in detail. But from our perspective, we're, we're thrilled about this round because it hits kind of two really key things. Uh, the Bitcoin users ability uh, to be sovereign, uh, to interact more easily with multi-signature uh, arrangements and, and full nodes, which which just dramatically increases, you know, both privacy and security. Uh, and uh, with what Global Mesh Labs is doing, uh, potentially helping, you know, birth a uh, an easier way for people to uh, take advantage of the Bitcoin protocol in places that don't have very you know, very, very good, uh, you know, infrastructure or internet access. So, so that's why we're, we're really happy about this, uh, this announcement here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was just speaking to uh, Randy Brito from Loco Mesh, or Locha Mesh, and he was very critical of the place where Bitcoin is in terms of uh, dependent on internet uh, providers and um, just existing infrastructure, especially in the first world. Um, Richard, why don't we start with you? Can you talk a little bit more about what Global Mesh is doing and what's next with Lot 49 and, and everything that you guys are building? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as <clears throat> Alex mentioned, I'm, I'm working with uh, two colleagues. So um, Fodi uh, Diop is in Senegal and he's really taken, you know, the his emphasis is really on this class of user, um, mostly outside of sort of the developed world, which is a mobile only user. So somebody with uh, expensive or perhaps intermittent or unreliable and potentially even censored access to the internet. Um, and then uh, Will Clark is actually somebody I've been working with uh, previously on working on sort of the low bandwidth access to the protocol. So changes that can be made both at the protocol level, specifically block headers, Block headers are already small, but um, especially when you're looking at going over something like ham radio or mesh radios like we make at Gotenna, um, you know, the protocol has room to be even more efficient at that low bandwidth. 
And um, what Lot 49 is, is really sort of the, the pinnacle of a stack of protocol uh, improvements and changes and sort of just uh, refinements that would allow uh, somebody with a mobile phone to basically run a Bitcoin wallet. So, so the protocol changes again are like with, ha with the Bitcoin headers, but then um, also adapting a Bitcoin wallet that can take advantage of some of these protocol um, features of Bitcoin, which is already fairly efficient in these ways, but make it fully um, sort of bandwidth aware and bandwidth efficient. And then from there, layer on lightning, which gives you even more of an off-grid ca capability. You know, so every transaction doesn't have to be synchronously checked in with the internet, which is what you would have to do if you were only on layer one. And then the final stack, which is really what Lot 49 is, is to turn that into a way to incentivize people to exchange messages, not just transactions, but actual communication um, using the Lightning Protocol. And this is similar to things like uh, WhatsApp or, or Sphinx Chat or, or um, there's one other I can't think of the name right now, but um, so, so really building within the framework that already exists for Lightning, but just adapting it for more of an off-grid use where anybody who sort of is a gateway to the internet or a relay for other people is collecting Lightning payments. So that's the sort of ultimate vision that we're trying to build up to. So awesome. I'm really grateful uh, to the HRF for helping us and giving us some recognition as we do this. Cause I think it's, it's something that Bitcoin you know, developers do appreciate, but the bandwidth specifically, I think just hasn't had the real focus. And I think that's where we're, where we're focusing. Fantastic. And I want to kind of dive a little deeper into the messaging and all that kind of stuff, but I do want to give Ben uh, some time to talk about what he's doing with Spectre Wallet. Ben has been a regular on Bitcoin Magazine for the past month and, or, or two. Um, kind of showing off and demoing Spectre Wallet. I personally am a huge fan and user. Uh, I recently did a video zero to, to solve sovereign multi-sig where I downloaded a Bitcoin core node on my MacBook, solve uh, Spectre Wallet, and then use uh, three popular hardware wallets, uh, you know, to really use Bitcoin in a very censorship resistant way. Ben, can you kind of talk about what you're doing with Spectre Wallet? Maybe what's next and what's getting you excited? Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, with Spectre Wallet, I think uh, just briefly, yeah, it just uh, briefly to introduce it uh, for listeners who might not know, uh, it's just uh, a UI for using Bitcoin Core with uh, with hard wallets with multi-sig. Uh, so you're essentially using Bitcoin Core and all its advanced features in a way which is uh, much easier for more for less technical users. Um, in terms of what's next, um, I think one thing which is uh, quite exciting for me is that uh, we're thinking on uh, packaging the Bitcoin Core uh, into Spectre itself. So instead of having to first download Bitcoin Core and then download Spectre and then connect between them, uh, just being able to directly have uh, Bitcoin Core packaged in there is uh, going to be quite nice. Uh, besides that, um, I, I think, well, it really depends on, on the users. Uh, we're really just listening to, to whatever people are asking for uh, at the moment and just trying to implement that. Can you, talk, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, what the user experience was to try to get a similar, or what, what was, how, how much more, how much easier has Spectre plus Bitcoin Core or just Spectre in general made the process of doing self-sovereign multi-sig because personally i i wasn't doing it before specter like that that was what you know kind of from a ux perspective made it approachable for me mm -hmm. yeah for sure so before specter um i believe you either had to use electrum uh and that means you need uh to do this in full sovereign way you need to have an electrum server and uh, now we have like slightly easier options, but uh, before Spectre, we only like the best option was Electrum Personal Server, which is still uh, quite, I mean, pretty cumbersome to, to set up and takes a lot of space. Um, in, well, yeah, in general, so with, with Spectre, we just connect to the Bitcoin Core directly. Um, 
and you just you instead of having to download the Electrum to play with the configurations to set up an Electrum personal server, connect that to your Bitcoin Core uh, and all that stuff. Uh, with Spectre, all you need to do is to download Bitcoin Core, download Spectre, and that's it pretty much. Uh, so I think it really uh, shortens the way. It shortens the requirements uh, since it requires only a print node. Uh, you you can use a full node, it's better, but you really don't have to. So with just a few uh, gigabytes uh, on your Mac or whatever, you can start using Bitcoin Core and Spectre. Yeah, I mean, you guys, if you have been scared of running a node and doing self-sovereign multi-sig, you know, it's really not that scary. And he's right about the prune node. It's less than five gigabytes after you've downloaded the entire blockchain. So um, very much an approachable thing. I mean, you can run it on your everyday driver. So it's very exciting. Um, Alex, you kind of talked about this a little bit that you see both of these projects complementing each other really well. One is like base level on-chain security and on the other side is like layer two and uh, messaging and all that other good stuff. Can you kind of talk about, you know, how these kind of go as a one-two punch and um, where do you see Bitcoin kind of driving uh, technology really? Because this is a new paradigm in, in technology for the masses. Yeah, well, I think they're both different parts of the Bitcoin ecosystem and, um, what you have is uh, what Ben's working on is strengthening the, the resilience and decentralization of the network by making it possible for more people to be sovereign, more people to be running full nodes, uh, more people to protect their assets from seizure. So you're really strengthening that kind of core value proposition and base layer of Bitcoin. Um, and then that's building a stronger foundation for uh, second layer uh, technologies like, for example, what, what Richard and, and team are working on, um, where you can then rely on that stronger foundation, which is not just stronger because of what's happening with the price and awareness and global uh, demand, but also uh, technologically sort of stronger because you have, you know, more people uh, backing that decentralization. Uh, now, you know, they can then be more confident in, in building on that base layer and setting up you know, solutions that were otherwise technically impossible uh, for people to do commerce and communications, again, in places with uh, rough, either intentionally rough, i.e. censored, or you know, unintentionally just, just bad infrastructure, uh, you know, internet access uh, places. And, and there's, you know, let's face it, hundreds of millions of people who deal with that every, every day. So uh, we love this kind of idea, like this one-two punch uh, Richard, do you kind of, and, and Ben, do you guys want to give a comment into how you see, uh, you know, on-chain uh, validation and then kind of layered on top of a more decentralized um, mesh networking, how that kind of fits together? Maybe we can start with you, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think some people might see it as being a bit at odds because, of course, the gold standard is always going to be to run your own full node. And of course, a, co a core full node is, is the full node you want to run. Um, but the way we see it is that there's, there's a, you know, a large percentage of the population, as Alex mentioned, that is going to only have a mobile device. And, and it current, it's actually not going to be easy for these people to run a full node uh, on their mobile device. So um, I think that may change at some point. But even if you know you can imagine mobile devices getting more powerful and lower, you know, lower cost, um, bandwidth is actually still very centralized, and that's always going to probably be an impediment. So um, that's why we're really focused on the bandwidth aspects of it. I think where these two projects maybe interact is um, you can imagine somebody, you know, once you get to the point where they're self-sovereign of their keys, even if they don't necessarily run their own full node, um, you can still do things like with PSBTs and uh, multi-sig wallets and that's you know i i see a world where people have more of a community full node so there might be one guy who's in the family who is the guy who can run that full node and then you know they have satellites people who you know it's obviously a trusted situation but now they can run it off their their device their mobile device their low-end mobile device and maybe you know have some sort of sort of security amongst themselves by using 
multi-sig. I think that's a very um, compelling argument for people who want to be self-sovereign, but don't necessarily even, um, you know, like maybe they don't have the ability to have a hardware wallet. And there's, all, oh, there's some arguments against that anyway, uh, but can still use multi-sig by having, you know, collection of mobile devices. So uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the way I see these things um, being a, a consistent story for getting just basically at all levels, making people more self, self-sovereign in their use of Bitcoin. Ben, you want to jump in? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I think there's, yeah, I think I pretty much agree. And I think the, the point on community nodes, uh, let's call it, is very, very good. Um, I don't expect, you know, I don't expect every single person the, to run their own node, not anytime soon at least. Uh, but I do see uh, the possibility that, you know, somebody of, of the family or of some certain community will run it for, for many people that essentially trust him because they, they know him very well. He's a fam- close family member uh, or something like that. Uh, and I think that's already a pretty good uh, achievement. So I think going in that direction makes a lot of sense. Um, we're, we have some, uh, Inspector specifically, we have some uh, option to uh, use multiple users. So you can share your Spectre node with, with like family if you want. Um, but yeah, I think this is a very interesting point to, to see how it will develop. So let's talk a little bit more about the HRFs, uh, the HRFs fundraising for Bitcoin developments more generally. Um, Alex, obviously the Winklevoss brothers and Gem and I were part of this and they've, uh, they've uh, committed to doing even more and other organizations are working with you guys. Can you talk a little bit about the program in general and uh, you know, who are you looking to gather funds from and how are you looking to direct those funds? Sure. Um, well, to be brief, there was no possibility before June of 2020 to uh, donate to a nonprofit uh, advocacy organization uh, that would that would support Bitcoin development. It simply didn't exist uh, in a way where you, as an American, you could get a tax write off. So we decided to try to set an example for hopefully for other organizations. Um, my hope would be that one day uh, you have major civil liberties groups beyond HRF like the ACLU or, or EFF or uh, you know Amnesty uh, doing this sort of work as well. Um, it, it's going to take some time I think for them to grasp uh, the big picture of Bitcoin. Uh, uh, I think the current um, Price action is probably drawing their attention to it, uh, you know. Hopefully, and you know, is probably more persuasive than we can all ever be ourselves. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's very healthy that Bitcoin be supported not just by corporations, but also by uh, nonprofit organizations, advocacy groups, and universities. So um, I, I hope that we are at the beginning of a big journey where more and more and more groups are. Uh, getting involved and supporting whatever they think is interesting and important. Um, obviously, people like Ben, Richard do a lot of voluntary stuff for Bitcoin because they are passionate about this global freedom financial network. Um, but it is going to be, you know, incumbent upon many others to help us, you know, to help them, you know, be able to spend more time on it, and and you know, for us to be able to even make this sort of modest uh, contribution to them so that, you know, they can be remunerated for their time is, is very exciting to us. And we hope, again, we hope to like set an example for other organizations. So we do have like a meta, a meta goal here, a meta narrative um, that hopefully can be global. I mean, maybe you see organizations uh, in West Africa, uh, in Israel and elsewhere also starting to realize that, Hey, maybe, maybe they should get involved and, support people working in the Bitcoin space. Um, I think that hopefully will happen over time. Yeah, and I think like uh, a key theme here is the HRF has come to an understanding that Bitcoin is a, a, an important tool in, uh, in protecting and furthering human rights and individual rights. Um, I would like to kind of go with Ben and then Richard and, and talk about like, 
what does Bitcoin mean to you guys from that perspective? And, and how do you see Bitcoin uh, furthering, you know, humans and individuals? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll start. So I think for me, the, the most interesting thing about Bitcoin is that you, you can't really easily censor someone in the sense that uh, you can't limit uh, certain people. So for me, uh, the, the reason for me, uh, the way I say it, experienced it, uh, is that uh, since I started working uh, as a developer at young age, uh, I couldn't really open a bank account. Uh, and generally banks were, were doing me a lot of troubles uh, in the beginning. So Bitcoin uh, just allows to, to bypass them. Uh, I don't need to ask permissions from them to, to earn money, to spend my money. Uh, it was get, getting sometimes ridiculous where I just to spend more than a hundred bucks or so. I had to like come to the, to the bank with, with my parents and, you know, and ask for them. It was completely ridiculous at times. Uh, and just for, for minors to, to earn money with and deal with banks, it's complete. Uh, it's it's insane uh so for me i just found how much easily it is to use bitcoin and not have to ask anyone um just you know it just use it uh however i want uh so this is the aspect which i think is is the the most incredible to me yeah what a boon for young inventors and entrepreneurs who are otherwise restrained by a restrictive legacy financial system Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm excited to see how Bitcoin enables the youth. That's for sure. Like, I feel like the current system yeah. is wasting so much social capital and human capital. Um, and a Bitcoin, a permissionless system, an open system, hopefully can change that. Richard, let's jump to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just sort of speak for, for Fodi on our team, you know, who's, who's in Senegal. And I think that also applies not just to the youth, but just to, like you said, like a large percentage of the globe has been cut out of, of the modern economy. And I think that Bitcoin is, is already in the process of changing that, which is very exciting. Um, you know, just for me personally, when I, when I think about, you know, what attracted me to, to Bitcoin and what attracts me to this sort of aspect of Bitcoin, I think back to sort of, you know, my, you know, my admiration for the original cypherpunks, which were really the foundation, you know, built all the foundational technology, which has evolved over decades uh, into Bitcoin. One thing that sort of sticks out from from their writings is this idea that um, you know we can't have you can't have individual privacy unless everybody has privacy. So when we work on this technology, um, we're working on it personally because every but it has to be done in a way that everybody can use it to really. I mean, you can't can't be the one guy walking around with a mask on. You know, then your privacy isn't really real. It's got to be you know privacy is something that is is enhanced by by sharing. And that's a lot of the philosophy, I think, that goes into um, how Bitcoin privacy works, too, is um, the more we can do things to make, um, you know, accessing the network more private or, um, you know, making transactions uh, in a way that's more private. And that's part of that is at the communication layer. So as long as your communications are all through an ISP that has all of your personal identifying information, um, then there's going to be a limit on how much privacy you can get. So if you're, you know, you've got an ISP that, that knows who you are. Um, so that's why, you know, part of our focus is on mesh technology and radios and things that can make your access to the Bitcoin network um, physically, physically obscured. Um, so that's, you know, that's a, a privacy aspect of Bitcoin that I think isn't perhaps critical at the moment, but is going to grow in criticality as, as this becomes more of a serious thing. And, and, Richard, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, from HRF's perspective, you know, we, we'd love to hear you just describe maybe a near future situation where a user of your uh, uh, technology is able to evade or get around unnecessary restrictions uh, to, you know, whether it's to commerce or uh, send, send a message where it would otherwise not be possible. Could you just paint like a quick um, practical picture of what that might look like? Yeah, I, I mean, in the messaging stamp, you know, if you're thinking about a messaging standpoint, you don't have to look too far. If you, you know, you could look at Hong Kong, for example. I mean, yeah. there's a situation where people are afraid to communicate. They're afraid to buy tickets without cash. And 
that's an example of both, you know, both economic communication, you know, using your credit card or, or trying to organize to meet at a certain place for a rally. Um, you know, it's going to be hard with any centralized communication system to not have those systems eventually used for law enforcement, whether you believe that laws are, are just or not, just because of the nature of centralized communication. And these people have licenses from the government. And so they're, they're obviously um, going to be responsive to those powers that be. Whereas decentralized communication, peer to peer, you know, if you can, if you can hop your message over multiple um, radio links, uh, could be Wi-Fi, could be Bluetooth, but ideally something longer range, yeah. um, which is sort of, you know, that's, that gives you a physical layer of sort of like a Tor network. Um, and, and that's why Lot 49 is trying to incentivize people to run those hidden, sort of hidden links in, the, in that, that hop network. So by the time your message actually gets to a uh, on-ramp, a gateway to the internet, um, it's completely obscured. So basically, like you could have a situation in an urban area inside of a dictatorship where the dictator knocks out the internet, but the citizens have been financially incentivized to run uh, these little networks, and it allows people to coordinate uh, effectively even even when the internet gets cut out. Correct? Yeah, that's a very good point. So by putting a financial incentive on it, people might run this, you know, when things are going well. But once it's in place, uh, when there's a when there's a political event going on. These networks would be resilient to that to that takedown, and and hopefully yeah. grow in that situation. <laughs> no, this is what the this is the best thing about Bitcoin is that it's again it harnesses human self interest and greed, which are just part of our nature. I mean, there's no getting rid yeah. of it, um, but it it kind of converts it to uh, in many ways freedom for others and, and a better opportunity for others. Um, the people who are running your uh, you know these these instances, um, you know these lot forty nine instances they might not, not care at all about human rights. They're just running them so that, to make a little bit of money. But you know, you and others and people in, in on those circumstances are gonna be able to harness that to do good and to break out of the censorship shell. So that's that's just a, like a remarkable piece of, of Bitcoin's kind of game theory that I always um, love to think about. Absolutely, it's that, that Trojan horse meme that you've mm -hmm. posted a few times that's a... <laughs> Bitcoin is the Trojan horse for for things that are are you know freedom loving. I feel I feel like a good way to summarize what Alex just said is Bitcoin aligns incentives and it allows people yes. to be individually you know to to take care of themselves and you know that creates the foundation for assurances that anyone can plug into, which is it's just amazing to see that in so many facets of Bitcoin, not just one. It's it's just everywhere throughout Bitcoin. Well, it's, it's with Ben too, too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if why would you run a full node? Well, mainly it's uh, self-interest uh, for your ability to, to, to make sure you're not being given fake coins or to be able to verify mm -hmm. the supply. But reality, if everybody's doing this out of their own self-interest, it creates a public, almost like a public good, essentially. So again, you can see this in both of these projects. Absolutely, and I mean, I think that that's just a testament to how HRF is going about, you know, finding and supporting different projects that are important to Bitcoin. So I love that. Um, I think we're going to get into the end of our time here. Would love to give the three of you each uh, uh, an opportunity to give a last word. Let's start with Ben, then go to Richard, and then Alex, you can close this out. Uh, yeah, sure. So just want to, to give a huge shout out, first of all, to, to the whole team of Spectre. So Kim and Stepan and Moritz. Um, and of course, to, to the HRF, it's really huge the, in this grant. Um, really appreciate it a lot. And yeah, I just uh, a lot of things are coming to Spectre, so just keep an eye for that. Let's go to you, Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely um, want to def uh, show you know how appreciative we are to the HRF for what they're doing. You know, beyond just this grant, because. It's, uh, it's something that we are you know, really proud to be a part of and, and hope to, to push forward. And I also wanna emphasize that you know, we are a project creating these tools, but you know, part of our mission is to expand the pool of people working in this area. Um, it's, you know, it's like most aspects, there's, there's many aspects of Bitcoin and this is just the one that we're sort of pushing on, but we, we think there's a lot more that can be done um, to make uh, decentralized communication and just decentralized Bitcoin usage uh, more prevalent and more part of the sort of mainstream of, of what people are doing. So uh, I hope anybody who's a developer or, or just interested in testing this stuff will 
will get in touch and, and help join us uh, to make this even a bigger, bigger and quicker sort of progression. So yeah, thanks. Alex, uh, why don't you take it away? Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll close it out. So um, it's kind of fun to look at the grants we've given out as a cohesive uh, narrative because you have what we discussed today, which is kind of like, um, you know, expanding uh, the usability of this network, uh, both to, uh, you know, expand people who are using multi-signature uh, arrangements who are running full nodes and who are able to use the network in, in kind of edge cases where, where their access is uh, compromised. Um, but then you also have our last gift, which was to Gloria Zhao, who's doing Bitcoin core development uh, in the netpool, which is important to all of us. We need, we need you know, a constant improvement in that area to make the network more efficient and to empower Lightning. And you go back further and we had a round of gifts to uh, Evan Kaloudis and uh, Fontaine and OpenNOMS who are working to make things like uh, Lightning and uh, like join market uh, more usable, like which is very exciting. And then the initial gift we gave that was to Chris Belcher, who's trying to figure out a way to, to get CoinSwap uh, in the hands of many, many people via a phone app ultimately, which would be super cool. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, look at not just, uh, let's say core development, um, which is going to remain an important part of what we do, um, but also like supporting the, the FOSS devs who are working on the next level up, right? Working on, like the products that people are actually gonna use beyond, beyond core itself. So I think these are both very important things for us to focus on. And, you know, hopefully our actions have told a story so far of kind of what we wanna do and we'll keep doing it. We're, we're, you know, it's exciting to get more and more support and, and that support continues to uh, increase in value versus other assets. So that's very good too. <laughs> that's good news for the people getting gifts from us. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted, uh, everybody at Bitcoin Magazine for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from Bitcoin Magazine to all the audience, thank you so much for listening. Make sure to give all three of these gentlemen a follow and a follow for all their organizations. All of that will be in the show notes. You can follow me at CK underscore snarks and make sure to follow Bitcoin Magazine everywhere where we are doing our thing. Um, and yeah, thank you again, everyone for, for jumping on and, uh, just really excited to see what the HRF is doing, see all of these projects, all the projects that you have funded and, and now, uh, and now adding global mesh inspector to that is, uh, is just keeping it up. So, uh, very exciting stuff.